Good day and good evening to you, wherever you're at in this part of the world. I have a family member that wrote a book some time ago. This was published in 1949. It's called The High Cost of Vengeance by Frida Utley. She has a foundation, or there's a foundation in her name in England. This was published in 1949 by the Henry Regent Re, uh, Company from Chicago. This book's a little bit different. After World War II, the Council of Foreign Nations was formed. One moment. My computer has froze up. It'll just be one moment. Let me close out some windows. Maybe this will help. Now, even former President Ronald Reagan has quoted Frida Lee and had his thoughts on her. Read a little expert, a excerpt about Frida Utley from the writings of Ronald Reagan. I was reminded of all this not long ago when a very remarkable woman in Washington, D.C. died just a few days short of her 80th birthday. One moment. Let me turn this down to just a little bit more. It just sounds loud. Okay, I think we can make this work. So again, from Ronald Reagan. It's Reagan in his own hand, the writings of Ronald Reagan, that revealed his revolutionary vision for America. And this is, I think, page 136. Again, he says, I was reminded of all this not long ago when a very remarkable woman in Washington, D.C. died just a few days short of her 80th birthday. It would be impossible to count the lives she touched in England, where she was born, in China, Japan, in the Soviet Union, and here in her adopted home, the United States. She once described herself as a premature anti-communist. I told the truth about communism long before the world was prepared to hear it, end quote. And Frida Utley knew the truth about communism because as an idealistic young woman in the 1920s, she accepted communism. In fact, she married a Russian and went to live in Moscow. After he was taken away by Stalin's secret police, she came out of Russia and wrote a book, The Dream We Lost, in which she said, The just and the unjust enter through the same revolving door, and the steam pressing in with great expectations is matched or exceeded by the crowd of disillusioned getting out. Going on to page 139, He wrote this, but many of the intellectuals didn't want to hear what she had to say. She had an impressive, impressive academic credentials when she came to the U.S., but publishers and the academy closed doors against her. She understood all too well. She had tried communism and learned its falseness. She has said only those, quote, who have never fully committed themselves to the communist cause, end quote, can continue to believe in it. Her book, The China Story, which told of how the Reds were taking over, became a bestseller after China was lost. Quote, It is bone-chilling now to read that the Soviet defector Olga Glavulev, former consultant to the Krem Kremlin on strategic arms, is telling our government Russia has the cruise missiles already deployed in submarines off our coast. Is anyone really... Um, then it stops there. And that's from the FridaUtley.com site. Now, I think this book, this writing that she wrote, The High Cost of Vengeance, really lends itself to today's dynamics. The book was made possible by a research grant from the Foundation for Foreign Affairs. And the Foreign Affairs was also established in 19, 
49, the foundation that is. That's when she got the copyright for this. I, she's an amazing woman. I, I'm, I'm honored to be in the same family tree as her. So I, she's just jaw-dropping. And that's why I want to talk about her and read part of her book. The copyright has expired, so when copyrights expire, you can read them. So um, she does say to my dear friends, John and Joan Crane, I'm going to find out who they were, whose help and encouragement have been invaluable in the writing of this book. She has a fascinating, fascinating history. I really encourage you to take a look in. I, I like the second chapter, The Spirit of Berlin. You have to understand, in the 1920s, Berlin was it. It was hedonism alive. It was the Las Vegas of the world. Every type of debauchery you could think of, you could get. There was one street, I, if I memory serves me right on my research, one street where there was uh, cripples and uh, hunchbacks, that were selling their wares, so to speak, prostituting on the street. Lots of prostitutes in Berlin at that time. Then she goes on in the third chapter to talk about the material cost of vengeance. Uh, fourth is tragedy in Sigurland. In the fifth chapter is German democracy between Scalia and Scherbelis. Six is the Nuremberg judgments. I also like to point out there was a, it's called Imperium. You can also get it on a PDF file. I'm trying to remember the name of the author who used a pseudonym. Mm, I'll remember it in a moment. But um, he died under suspicious circumstances in a federal prison. He'd been thrown in jail for speaking the truth. Let me see if I can remember his full name. I want to say it's Yachny or Yachers and Imperium Francis, I think. Let's see if it comes. Francis Parker Yachny. Yaki. Y-O-C-K-E-Y. -E it's a good book to read along with this one, I think. It's the philosophy of history and politics. And it's a masterpiece. It is truly a masterpiece. And it's not an easy read, you know, you take time to read it. You know, I think it will help you be more well-versed into how the emotional, <laughs> um, and what's really behind the politics that you see today or what they allow you to see. You know, seven, the seventh chapter in her book, The High Cost of Vengeance, is Our Crimes Against Humanity. And she's talking about the United States shocker right we committed so many crimes in germany that they covered it up by blowing up the holocaust eisenhower was behind this by the way and she talks about that in great detail she had worked with eisenhower or i forget the, the journalist the she goes on to the next chapter our un-american activities in germany we really should be ashamed the ninth chapter is how not to teach democracy do you see what a good book this is uh, 10th chapter, the French ride high, and then the conclusion is the 11th chapter. Just as Veterans Day this year was on the 11th day of the 11th month. And if we look at the closing of World War One, it was on the 11th month, at the 11th day, at the 11th hour, literally the 11th hour. And if we fast forward to the first election of our president, Barack Obama, he was elected on the 11th month, at the 11th day, at the 11th hour. It was announced that he was to be president of the United States of America. Everything's connected. I really do believe that. Now, from the Peloponnesian War, there is a quote, and she has this in her book. I'm going to do a series of podcasts on this, by the way. It says, Do not be seduced by the prospect of a great alliance. Abstinence from all injustice to other powers is a greater tower of strength than anything that can be gained by the sacrifice of permanent tranquility for an apparent temporal, temporary advantage. You know, there's a lot to be said about that. A lot to be said. So why don't we start with the f first chapter, which is 
the road to war. I hope I'm not overmodulating. If I am, please let me know later because I'm not going to read the chat room. So the road to war is the first chapter. We shall begin. Following World War I, France and Britain refused to listen to the statesmen who had said that you can have peace or vengeance, not both. They broke their armistice pledge to Germany that peace would be made on the basis of President Wilson's 14 points and the principles of settlement enunciated by the American president. They continued the starvation blockade of Germany for six months after the armistice in order to force the German Democrats, who had taken over the government, to sign a dictated peace. Having promised a peace without annexations or indemnities, they deprived Germany of territory and imposed a crushing reparations burden on the newly established Weimar Republic. Having promised general disarmament, they disarmed Germany without disarming themselves. The victors refused even to discuss the terms of peace with the vanquished who had surrendered on stated conditions which were not fulfilled, and in general discredited democracy in German eyes by associating it with broken pledges, natural humil humiliation, and economic distress. The Nazi movement, born from the dragon seeds planted at Versailles and brought to monstrous growth by the World Depression, which raised the total number of unemployed in Germany to 6 million, took power at the moment of Europe's and America's greatest economic crisis. And I do need to note that referring to the armistice, Maynard Keynes in 1919 wrote in his prophetic book the economic consequence of the peace quote the nature of the contract between germany and the allies is plain and unequivocal the terms of the peace are to be in accordance with the addresses of the president and the purpose of the peace conference quote to discuss the details of their applications end quote the circumstances of the contract were of an unusually solemn and binding character for one of the conditions of it was that the germany should agree to armistice terms which were to be as would leave her helpless the honor of the allies was thus peculiarly involved in fulfilling their part and if there were ambiguities i'm not using their position to take advantage of them end quote all right all right, going back to the text. Inevitably, the Second World War followed the first after interval of only 20 years. Instead of learning that you cannot build confidence in security, democracy, and prosperity on a foundation of hatred and vengeance, the victorious allies this time have torn Germany apart, deprived her of all possibility of existence without exterior aid, and while unable to agree among themselves on a peace treaty, have jointly reduced the defeated enemy country to the status of an African colony. History is repeating itself with results likely to be even more tragic for Europe than the events which led up to World War II. Once again, the victorious allies are making it impossible for the Germans to place their faith in democracy and justice, since they find justice denied and democracy mocked by the occupying powers. Listen to that. Once again, the German Democrats are in danger of yielding right away to totalitarians because legal methods and appeals to justice are again failing to obtain a fair deal for the German people. Last time we produced Hitler. This time we may succeed in giving Stalin homogeny over all Europe. If France followed World War I, ha had been prepared to treat Germany as